Hi again, everybody. Uh, just dividing this up so that we keep our files uh, as small as possible so you can download them, we can upload them to YouTube and so forth. So continuing with the lecture on Greece, I want to talk to you briefly about the Greek polis. Polis is the Greek word for a city-state. Athens was a polis, Sparta was a polis, there were dozens of others. Athens, as I said, was the largest. Uh, a city-state means a city that is self-governing or that governs itself without being under the auspices of a larger political entity. So think of New York City or Boston without the United States. These could be, these could still have a city government and, and they could govern uh, uh, the city and the and the environs or the uh, the um, agricultural areas around them. Um, the polis was envisioned and idolized as idealized as uh, a place that was very small where um, people basically everybody knew everybody else. So you know, think of a small town. And if it was kept that small, the political philosophers of the time believed it would it would function. If it got too large, it wouldn't uh, function. The two key polis, and this is just uh, the plural of polis, are Sparta and Athens, and they're really contrasted. And I'll tell you a quick story about the militaristic uh, Sparta. Boys left home at the age of seven, and they went to military training. Men ate in uh, men's clubs. They didn't eat at home. The women stayed home and, and uh, ate alone and lived a very sequestered life. Um, but there's a great story about a boy in, one of, in, in, in the Spartan Academy, if you will. Um, and one of the things they did was keep, them, keep these boys very hungry. Uh, the idea was that they would learn uh, to survive by their wits, to struggle, to steal food wherever they could, and to be tough, right? Uh, boot camp kind of thing. Well, the story is this boy caught a ferret, and just as he's getting ready to dispatch the ferret and, and prepare him for a meal, uh, he's called to attention. He's called to uh, uh, stand at attention uh, with everybody else in the yard, and he stuffs the ferret into his tunic there. The ferret then begins to eat a hole in his side, so this ferret is eating his organs. But of course, this kid being a good Spartan, he's only seven years old, but he's a good tough Spartan, uh, stands at attention nonetheless. Doesn't break a sweat, doesn't shed a tear, doesn't cry and scream, but then of course falls down and dies. Now the point of the story is supposed to be about the stoicism or the Spartan nature of the Spartans. In other words, how tough they were and how they could survive on nothing. Uh, but really you have to imagine what life was like if a kid was hungry enough to want to eat a, uh, a ferret. So militaristic Sparta uh, became increasingly militaristic because the whole concept here was that these kids would learn to work together. By the time they were 18, they would begin to train together militarily. They would form a hoplite squad, a tough, tight squad of, of shield and sword-bearing foot soldiers, and go out and conquer people. And as they conquered more people, they made them their servants. They made them their slaves. And in, as a result, they began to fear an uprising. Because they fear an uprising, of course, they become more militaristic, and it's this vicious cycle. Typically, Sparta is contrasted with Athens. Athens, we think of as the good guy in this story. Athens is the place that is the root of democracy. Okay? But the story is actually of Athens is actually more complex, has a much more complex history um, than, than simply talking about it as the root of democracy might lead you to believe. It is the largest city-state, and the people that they conquer, they don't uh, turn around and enslave the same way they do as in Sparta. And there is a lot more democracy and a lot more um, freedom and, and equality of, of rights for certain people in, in uh, Athens. But I just want to remind you and call you back to the Massachusetts Curriculum Framework that talks about democracy as the worthiest form of human governance ever conceived. I show you that, in fact, in Athens, the story is a little more complicated. It goes through different... Uh, uh, democracy is, is short-lived and, and is constantly reincarnated, if you will. Uh, around 600 BC, there is an agricultural crisis, and um, the result of the agricultural crisis is for a new set of laws to be created by a guy named Solon, and that seems to um, uh, prevent uh, starvation and, and rioting and those sorts of things until about 561 when this fellow Pisistratus seizes, too many Z's, but seizes power, 
and he begins to rule as what was known as a tyrant. And again, you can see the language is, is Greek. He was called a tyrant. Uh, he um, simply had um, singular power. Okay. About 510, another fellow named Clisthenes takes power, and he gets the help of the Spartans to bring his clan into power. In order to keep everybody happy, he creates something called a democracy. Okay. He allows all male citizens over the, uh, the age of 30 to serve in a council, a council of 500 people, to rule Athens. In fact, everybody's expected to serve, and not to serve is to be uh, um, frowned upon. So you serve a term or two, and every, every male citizen over 30, keep in mind not all males are citizens, and of course not everybody in Athens is male. Um, so that's 510, but look now, 50 years later, this fellow Pericles comes along and he emphasizes the rule of law and the courts to ensure that the slaves and these other uh, aliens that are in, in Athens also get representation and get justice. So in a lot of ways, what Clisthenes was uh, overseeing was not a democracy and in the sense of having not just um, the right to vote and freedom, but uh, rights before the law and justice. And justice is a really important part of this. So it, it's not as if it all happens at once. It's not as if it's all uh, uh, is that simple. And then finally, uh, two historians to quote here uh, to suggest that in a lot of ways it wasn't a democracy. Thucydides, uh, one of the first historians, wrote, it was in theory a democracy, but in fact it became the rule of the first Athenian. And when he says first Athenian, he means... Uh, the best Athenian. Herodotus, the so-called father of history, called it the rule of the best. And the word in, in uh, Greek is aristoi, and that's where our word aristocracy comes from. So both of these historians, two very learned and for the time even-handed uh, chroniclers of what was going on, said this wasn't really a democracy, this was an aristocracy. Okay, there you go. That's Greece, Greece in uh, way too little time. I appreciate your attention. Bye-bye.